My name is Taylor Thompson, and if you don't know me, I'm from uh, Huntington Beach, California. And uh, if you guys have recently fled from California, I just want to let you know that Jesus is still building his church in California, all right? There's still some work happening there, and uh, I'm excited to be here with you guys tonight. And uh, I just want to get a little feel for the room in here. Who here is lives here? You go to Compass Bible Church in Treasure Valley. Where are you guys at? Yeah, all right. Well, if you know Holly Blakey or Rob or Melanie Thompson, those are my family members, right? Rob and Melanie Thompson are my parents, and uh, Holly Blakey is my sister, all right? So uh, hopefully if you were unsure about me, now I got some, I scored a few points in your book, right? Um, now, who here is from out of town? Who here is from California, Compass Voucher from California or from Texas? Anybody from out of town here? Okay. The people that drove or flew from far away, well, welcome. Can we thank Treasure Valley for hosting us here this weekend. We want to thank you guys so much. We look forward to seeing you guys at Pathways Middle School on Sunday morning. Um, and I just want to know, is there anyone here that does not go to a Compass Bible Church? Anybody here that does not go to a Compass? Right here in the back. All right. Let's welcome him. Thank you for being here. Yeah, someone should buy him lunch tomorrow, all right? Yeah, you're already on it? Okay, great. Fantastic. Well, I hope if you, you know, whether you live here uh, in, the, in the great state of I Idaho or if you've driven or flown from further away, that you're not here to hear some guy give his opinions on what he thinks about the Bible, but you're here to hear from Jesus Christ himself. Are you guys ready to get into the Old Testament here today? Because we're here to answer this important question. Is the Old Testament still relevant? All right, that's what we're here to talk about. So as we dive into the Old Testament, I want everybody to open your Bible and turn to the New Testament, okay? Turn to the New Testament, and we're going to go to Luke chapter 24. That's where we're going to spend a couple minutes here tonight because Jesus is going to answer that question for us. And we want to hear what Jesus has to say when he thinks about the Old Testament. Is this something that's still relevant for us today? Well, let's look at what Jesus says says here in Matthew chapter, or I'm sorry, Luke chapter 24, and if you can see there the kind of the, the context here, if you look at uh, just right above the these subtitles here, you got the death of Jesus, you have Jesus is buried, and then you have the resurrection. So what just happened in the gospel of Luke is that Jesus, he died, and he rose from the dead, and if you read kind of these first couple verses here in Luke 24, it's the story of when Mary runs to the tomb, and they find the tomb is empty, and then they run in this news of Jesus that he's no longer in the tomb starts spreading. And we're going to pick it up right here in Luke chapter 24. Start with me in verse 13. It says, that very day, two of the men were going to the village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all the things they, that, they had, that had happened. Remember, these are, they're talking about the things that have happened to Jesus, that he died, that he rose from the dead, this report of him rising. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. So here you have a, these two disciples and they're hearing these reports about Jesus uh, rising from the dead. They're confused about what's going on. And then here comes Jesus, and he joins them on their walk, but they don't recognize that it's him. They can't tell that it's Jesus there with him. And he says this in verse 17. This is Jesus speaking. What is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still looking sad. Then one of them named Cleopas answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And he said to them, What things? And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and the rulers delivered him up to condemn him to death and to crucify him. 
But we had hoped that he was the one who would redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things have happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they, had, and, and, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that he had even seen him a vision of angels who said that, who said that he was alive. So some of these, excuse me, some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. So you have these two guys, and they're on this road, and they're, and they're talking, and, they, and you can tell, it says here right here that they are sad. They're sad because Jesus just died, and they were hoping that he was the one that was going to deliver them. He, they're hoping that he was the one that was going to redeem Israel, and so these guys, they're talking to him, and they're sad, and you need to see what Jesus says here in verse 25, because it might be something that we need to hear tonight ourselves. He says in verse 25, instead of comforting them and talking to them, what he says here in verse 25, he says, O oh, foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? So Jesus, when he sees that these guys are, you know, these guys are talking to him and how interesting this moment must be, right? These guys are trying to explain to Jesus about how Jesus died and how Jesus rose from the dead. And now Jesus is here saying, you guys are being foolish, and why does he say that they're being foolish? He says that they are slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? You see, Jesus expects that these guys should already know that he's going to die and that he's going to rise from the dead because it's already been talked about. It's already been told in the prophets he says that he is the Christ. These things that you guys should already know these things. You guys should be aware of these things because we told these things long ago. Jesus is saying that the gospel is in the Old Testament. Look what he says in verse 27. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all, th all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So now Jesus, he starts teaching these guys and he starts going through the law and the prophets and he's trying to tell these guys all the things that are concerning Jesus. And that's something that we maybe consider tonight. If I was to maybe throw out a little quiz and I say, hey, open up your booklets. We're going to take a little quiz for the next five minutes, right? Some of you guys are like, are we really going to do this, right? I thought about it, but we're not going to do this, all right? But what if we decided, hey, write down on your notepad as many Bible verses, as many passages in the Old Testament. Can you walk me through the gospel from the Old Testament? Can you walk us through? Can you share with somebody that Jesus is the Christ who died for sins and rose from the dead only using Old Testament verses? Do you even know that those things were prophesied long ago? Because Jesus is expecting that these guys would know that. He says, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he's interpreting them to the scriptures concerning himself. You see, Jesus is all over the Old Testament. We should be able to take the Old Testament and we should be able to bring people the gospel of Jesus Christ. He's expecting that these guys know this. He's expecting that he's even calling them foolish ones. You see, how many of us know the Old Testament well enough that we could point people to these prophecies about Jesus, things that would tell that he is God, that he is the Christ, that he came to die for our sins, and that he would rise from the dead. Did you guys know that those things are in the Old Testament? Look what he goes on to say. The conversation continues in verse 28. He says, uh, so they drew near to a village to which they were going, and he acted as if he was going further. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at table with them, he took the bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them. Look at this in verse 31. And their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he vanished from their sight. 
Okay, so we're now like probably hours with this guy, right? We've been with Jesus now walking around. He's teaching us from the Old Testament. He's opening up the scriptures to us. He's telling us about how Jesus would come, that he would die, that he would rise from the dead. And these guys have probably been with Jesus now for some time. And all of a sudden, they're sitting there breaking bread. And in a moment, they recognize this is Jesus. We've been with Jesus this entire time. And as soon as they recognize that this is Jesus, what happens? Poof, he's gone. Like, what would happen if that happened to you? Like, if you were at lunch tomorrow, and you were hanging out, and then all of a sudden, you were with some people, and Jesus disappears. You recognize this is him. He vanishes before your eyes. What do you say in that moment? Right? Are you looking around for him? Or like, where did he go? Did you see that? Hey, did you recognize that was Jesus? How did we not get this this entire time? Like, he was with us this whole time. We didn't recognize this was him. Look at what these guys say when Jesus Christ reveals to himself that he is there, and then he disappears before their eyes. This is what they say in verse 32. They said to each other, Did our hearts, did not our hearts burn with, uh, within us as he talked to us on the road while he he opened to us the scriptures. These guys look at each other after spending hours maybe with this guy. He's telling them the Bible. He's telling them the scriptures. He then vanishes before their eyes. And the thing that they want to talk about is the Bible study that they just had. Like, did you know that was in the Old Testament? Did you know that Jesus is the Christ, that he was the one prophesied, that he is the anointed one? Did you know that he was prophesied years, hundreds of years before it happened? There in different scriptures like Isaiah, that Jesus would die for us. Did you know that it was prophesied in the Old Testament that he would rise from the dead? Can you believe what just happened? Like these guys are nerding out about spending time in the scriptures rather than seeing Jesus right in front of their eyes. You see, that's what we want to ask ourselves here tonight, is do our hearts burn when we open up the Old Testament? Because here's my concern, and, and even just talking with a lot of people over the years, and even this is something I've thought myself, is that, that the Old Testament is really lesser scripture than the New Testament. Now, I've been growing up in the church in a long time, and I definitely would have agreed that this entire scripture is breathed out by God, that it's all profitable for us. I would say that this is the word of God, but still, in my thinking, and often, if I were to choose which part of the scripture I was going to read, I would choose the New Testament. You see, do our hearts burn within us? Do we recognize that in the Old Testament there is a treasure chest waiting to be unlocked, waiting to be found, and the Bible from, from beginning to end is all pointing us to Jesus? Because these guys, their hearts were burning. They were passionate. They were excited about what they were learning, what Jesus had revealed to them from the Scriptures. Look what it goes on to say. Now he's uh, dealing with his disciples. He, he meets up with his disciples. He shows them his hands and his feet. And drop down with me in verse 44. Uh, this is Jesus now speaking to them. And he's, uh, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understanding the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name. So Jesus He's now saying that the, the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms, that he came to fulfill all these things. He came to open their minds so that they can understand the scriptures. You see, that's something that Jesus did before he ascended into heaven, is that he opened the minds of his disciples so that they could see that the law of Moses, that the prophets, that the Psalms, they were all pointing us this whole time to Jesus in fact, at the time of Jesus, when this scripture is written, all they have is the Old Testament scrolls. 
And in the book of Acts, after Jesus ascends into heaven and all the disciples are there, in the book of Acts, I don't know if you guys have ever heard this story. Has anybody ever heard the story of when the first sermon of the church, when 3,000 souls get saved? Have anybody ever heard that story before? Okay, does anybody know the text of Scripture that Peter is preaching from in that passage? See, Peter, he's actually preaching from Joel chapter 2. Have you ever gone to Joel chapter 2 and been like, all right, I'm ready for my heart to burn. I'm ready to be revived in my soul. I'm ready for people to get saved. Because Peter, when he stood up in front of a large crowd, he preached from Joel chapter 2, and 3,000 souls get saved. You see, all Scripture is breathed out by God. All Scripture is profitable, and Jesus is trying to tell us that if you read the Old Testament like you're searching for treasure, like you're looking for Jesus on every page, man, your heart will burn. You will be revived in your soul because all this Scripture is living and active, not just the New Testament, but the law, he says, the prophets, and the writings. And notice how he lists it in those three different ways. See, today we think of the Bible in two different kinds of sections. We think of the Bible as the Old Testament, and we think of the Bible as the New Testament. But Jesus, the way that he talks about it, and you can actually find this when you start really reading through the Gospels all over the place, you're going to see him refer to it as the, the law, or the, and the prophets, and the writings, or the Psalms. See, Jesus actually breaks it up into three different sections. And Jesus, the way he describes it and the way that he talks about it, is he's saying that these, this is the, the word of God, right? It's broken up into three ways, the law, the prophets, and the writings. And if you know that and if you recognize that, you're actually going to find that all over the place in the scripture. Now, I put one of these on your uh, chair. If you sat on it, you can uh, grab it from underneath you or maybe pick one up. Uh, this is the Hebrew Bible, all right? Because at the time of Jesus, right, at the time of Jesus, the Bible was actually uh, in different order. The, the, the books were in a different order. And it, we had the same content, right? It was all the same content. But the Bible, the scriptures were all kind of in this different order. And you can see there that you have the law the prophets, and the writings. So the law was Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. When Jesus references the law, he's referencing the first five books of the Bible, and that's how it's ordered in our Bibles here today. But then it goes on to the prophets, and the prophets actually start with Joshua, and then it goes to Judges, and then we have Samuel and Kings, and if you think that's a typo, it's not, right? There is no First and Second Samuel or First and Second Kings in the, the original Hebrew Bible, and then we have Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and the Twelve. And if you're wondering what the Twelve are, it's what we usually refer to as the minor prophets, right? Which aren't very minor, right? It's supposed to be like, hey, they're smaller, but I, I would imagine that many of us maybe uh, think that the prophets, uh, the Twelve prophets are minor, right? Maybe you've never actually cracked open those pages in your Bible. Maybe they still stick together as you peel them apart and try to even find the minor prophets, See, we might kind of think of them as minor in even our own life, but even Peter, he's getting up and he's preaching from the minor prophets and souls are getting saved. So we have the law, we have the prophets, and then we have the writings or the Psalms, and it starts with Psalms and it goes to Proverbs, Job, and then we have the Megaloth, okay, and you can see the Megaloth right there at the bottom, and that's the, these are five scrolls that were put together, this is the Song of Songs, Ruth, Lamentations, Ecclesiastes, and Esther, so that's the Megaloth there, then we have Daniel, then we have Ezra and Nehemiah together, and then we have the book of Chronicles, just one book, one book of Chronicles, right, they split it up because it was too long, and really, if we're going to be honest, right, they probably should have split it up into like four parts, because how many of us even make it through the two, right? <laughs> so the Chronicles, that was one book, and so this is when Jesus is speaking, when he's talking, when we read these passages in the gospel, you're going to see this very often, the law, the prophets, and the writings. And there's actually a great case to even consider that when they, the Hebrew, when they had the, the Bible in this order, this is actually a very helpful way to even think about the Bible because in the law you have the law of Moses right that's something that Moses wrote but in Joshua now Moses is Moses now dies at the end of, uh, of the end of Deuteronomy and then he's passing on the law to Joshua and you can jot this down Joshua chapter 1 this is what it actually says uh, here about the law 
It says that in verse 8 of Joshua chapter 1, that this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written. You see, after the law, after Moses has written the law, he passed it on to Joshua, and Joshua is then supposed to take the law, and he was supposed to share it with the nation of Israel. They weren't supposed to forget the law. They were supposed to continue to think about the law and talk about the law. And even here in Joshua chapter 1, he says that we need to do the law. And so it's helpful even thinking about the books in this order, even as we get to the Psalms. So once you have the prophets, that's kind of like an, another book there in the Hebrew Bible. And then it goes to the writings and the way that Psalm chapter 1 talks about it. You can write down Psalm chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. This is the new book, the third book of the Hebrew Bible. It says, Blessed is the man who walks not according to the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is on the law of the Lord and on his law he meditates day and night. You see the the Old Testament as we think of it today, right? If you think if you read it really with the, the way that the Hebrews have ordered it here that you actually you can see how it builds upon itself. Like, when we get into the prophets, it's, it's Joshua taking the law, and he's saying, okay, Moses gave us the law, now we're going to keep on teaching the law. We get into book number three, and he says, hey, we're going back to the law, right? It's kind of building on itself here, and even kind of the order of these books is very helpful when we think about them in this original way, because in our English Standard Version today, uh, Jeremiah comes after Ezra, this is just one of those little things that kind of comes up when you think about the way that they ordered it here is that in the Hebrew Bible, Ezra actually comes after Jeremiah. Well, it kind of is hard to make sense of it if you read the book of Ezra before Jeremiah because Jeremiah prophesies about what will happen and it's fulfilled in the book of Ezra. So when we're reading the book of Ezra before Jeremiah, we might get confused a little bit because Jeremiah is telling us about things that are going to happen and then Ezra is showing up and saying, hey, just as Jeremiah the prophet had spoken and Jeremiah speaks in, in chapter 25, verse 12, Ezra quotes that in Ezra chapter 1 and Ezra is saying, hey, just like Jeremiah the prophet said, now it is happening. So you can see there, they were probably on to something here when they, when they ordered these books, and it's very helpful for us to think about that in this way. And I have with me, I, I got a little uh, a box here, that this is uh, something that I you know, have in my office at the church, and what this is right here is this is the Old Testament. And I brought this to us as a visual because it's helpful to think about it because the, the books of the Bible, even in the, in the Hebrew Bible, they, they, there's a different number of books. And there's a different way of thinking about the books. And this is kind of the, the, the order in the Hebrew Bible. And when you look at the Bible like this, you start to realize, oh, there's actually a lot of different books in the Scripture, right? We, we carry around this one right here. And let me tell you, it's a lot easier to carry around this thing than this thing. All this thing's got some weight to it, right? But here, in, the, in this, you know, as you can see here, we have all kinds of different books here. We have all the books of the Bible, all the same content is right here. But you can see that the way that they kind of had it ordered out. So right here we have the first five books. This is the Law of Moses, if I can grab that, right? This is the Law of Moses right here. And so this is the law, and then we have the prophets, and then right over here, starting here, moving this way, we have the Psalms, or the writings. And so when Jesus is speaking, he's talking about the law, he's talking about this section here, and then he moves on to the prophets here, and then we move on to the Psalms, or the writings. And it's very helpful to think about the Bible and to see it in this way, that this book is actually a collection of books. And in fact, if you got one of these, a version of the Old Testament, if you got a New Testament version, it's about, in the, the same, the same uh, ESV crossway put this out, it's about that thick, all right? So the, ESV, the New Testament is about this thick, and we have the Old Testament is about this thick, and so when we think about that, and we kind of see those two side by side, that thing is heavy, Whew, get tired, <laughs> left arm, right? When we see these things side by side, we start to realize that if we want to dismiss the Old Testament, if we want to say that these books are irrelevant, right, that these books don't matter, we are getting rid of most of the Scripture. We are saying, hey, we're not going to read that. This is irrelevant. We don't have to look at that. This is old, outdated, and we're left with this much, right? 
Now this much is extremely important, and I love reading this much, but we gotta see that if we're gonna say, hey, we don't have to read the Old Testament, look at how much treasure we're missing out on. There's a lot here that we can learn from. There's a lot here that we can grow from, and Jesus is saying in our passage that all this, all this book right here, this is all about me. That you should have known you should have known the prophecies. You should have known that I was going to come and die because it's already been written in this book. So Jesus, excuse me, he expects us to know the Old Testament. He expects us to know the law, the prophets, and the writings. So we did this thing a couple years back at our church, something crazy, okay? What we did is we took all the men and we went on a men's retreat up the mountain, okay? And in California, it's probably more like a small hill, but we refer to it as a mountain out there, right? And uh, we took all the men, we went up on the mountain <clears throat> for a men's retreat, excuse me. And when we were up there, we opened the law and we started teaching from the book of Genesis. We're going to start from the beginning and we're going to read the book of Genesis, and so we got all the men up on the mountain. We started reading just the first couple of chapters of Genesis. And then on Sunday, we all came back down the mountain. We got all the whole church together, all the men, women, and children, right? We got them together, and we started preaching through the law. We started preaching through the book of Genesis. And then what would happen is we'd preach on Sunday, we'd open up Genesis, and we'd read the Word, and then every day that week we would start reading through Genesis. We'd start reading maybe chapter, this week is chapter 4 through 14, or whatever it may be. We start reading every single day as a church, and then when we gather back together again as a church, we started, we, the next sermon was from the book of Genesis. We just preached the next passage. And we started, we read again, and then we preached the next passage, and we read again, we preached the next passage. We do that through Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Yes, we did it through Leviticus, everybody. <laughs> the, the place that Bible reading plans die, right? The book of Leviticus. And you know what we found in the book of Leviticus? You know what we found in the law? You know what we found in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy? We found Jesus all over the place. In fact, there's people, you can go find them. They're in Huntington Beach, California, right? They will tell you that Leviticus is their favorite book of the Bible. There was this girl that got baptized, and in front of the whole church, she said, I got saved when we went through Leviticus. Leviticus, what? Right, like Leviticus, really? Like, it's now, you know, lovingly known at our church as Legiticus, right? Because it's legit, right? Some people think of it as Legiticus, some of the college kids. Because we love Leg Legiticus. We love Leviticus. It, is, it has Jesus in it. It teaches us about who he is. In fact, we won't fully understand what he did as our sacrificial lamb unless we know the book of Leviticus. Unless we go and find him there. And so people will tell you. I mean, I, I talked to this guy over the phone just yesterday, and he was saying that he got saved when we are going through the minor prophets, right? That doesn't sound very minor, right? This guy got saved at our church, and now when I think of the book of Nahum, right, I think of my friend because he got saved going through that book. You see, the scripture is all breathed out by God. The scripture is going to point us to Jesus. And we, so we found Jesus all over the law. We found him over the prophets, and we found him in the writings, and our hearts burned as we read these passages, as we found Jesus. And that's what Jesus is offering us here tonight. Is he's saying, hey, do your, does your heart burn? Do you look for me when you read the Old Testament? When you find scriptures that tell of Jesus coming thousands of years before he came, that tells us how he was going to die, that prophesies about his resurrection from the dead, does that make your heart burn? When you find some nugget of gold as you read through the Old Testament, do you just want to share that with people? Or has the Old Testament kind of been something, ah, i got to put that aside. This is, you know, in my mind, my, I, don't, I wouldn't say it's lesser scripture, but hey, I'm kind of going to breeze through it on my way to the New Testament. I just talked to a guy about an hour ago, right before we started the first session, and he said to me, yeah, you know what, I actually, when I read the scripture, I actually do blow through the Old Testament. I kind of skim through it because then I want to read the New Testament. And he said it to me like, I'm not, I'm not right for doing that, right? He owned it. And he's not in this room right now, so it's okay, right? You don't have to look around at anybody. 
But he was thinking, yeah, I actually do that. I kind of skim through the Old Testament. Maybe it's hard to understand. Maybe I'm not expecting to find Jesus. Maybe I'm not expecting to see this burning come from within the, the, the law as I read it. And he says, yeah, I just kind of skim through it because I want to get to this other stuff. When you start reading through the New Testament, the Old Testament makes so much more sense. Like, as you start reading, when you know the Old Testament so well, when you've read it, when you've looked at it, man, the, the scripture in the New Testament, oh, it's going to click. Like, we've read now through the whole thing together as a church, and we just started going through the book of Matthew, and now when I'm reading Matthew, it's like I'm reading it sometimes for the first time. It's like I'm starting to see things in the book of Matthew. I'm more excited right now today to read through the book of Matthew than ever before because I understand now a lot more of what Jesus is saying because when Jesus is talking in the book of Matthew, so often he's referencing what's going on in the law, the prophets, or the writings. In fact, go with me to the book of Matthew. Look at, go with me to chapter 19. And Jesus, he actually... Uh, expects people will know what he's talking about when he when he's talking here in many of the passages in the book of Matthew Jesus many times he had the Pharisees or scribes coming to him and they're trying to question him they're trying to trap him in his words and Jesus comes on the scene and he's able to speak to them in such a way that they left marveled like the crowds could not believe the answers of this man and it says in Matthew chapter 19 this is a Pharisee coming and he's trying to come and test Jesus it says this in verse 3, the Pharisees came up to him and tested him by asking him, is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? All right, so here's their big question. They want to stump Jesus. They want to trap him with the word. They want to test him, and they come to Jesus, and they're saying, hey, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? And look at how Jesus answered, have you not read? Have you not read? Don't you understand? Don't you know the Old Testament? Don't you understand that this has already been written, that he who created them from the beginning made them both male and female? And then he quotes Genesis, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Hey, who do you guys think you're talking to? Don't you understand that this was already talked about in the book of Genesis? Don't you already know that this was written in the law? You see Jesus, he's coming right at these guys saying, You're trying to trap me. This has already been talked about. You guys should know this. Go with me, just maybe a page over or two, to uh, Matthew chapter 22. And here we have these Sadducees, and they're coming to do the same thing. And if you grew up in church, you might have heard that the Sadducees are sad, you see, because they don't, they don't believe in the resurrection, right? That's why they're so sad, right? And it says here in verse 23 of Matthew chapter 22 that the Sadducees came to him who say that there is no resurrection. So these guys, they don't believe in life after death. These guys don't believe in the resurrection. They clearly have never read Psalm 16, which talks about the resurrection of the dead. And then Jesus answered them. Well, look what it says in verse 28. Drop down to verse 28, and it says, and this is their question, right? In the resurrection, therefore, of these seven, he's talking about these wives, they all have a diff, they have this, this wife marries all these different husbands, and they keep dying, and so whose wife will they be in heaven? And it says in verse 28, in the resurrection, therefore, of the seven, whose wife shall they be? Like, this is their big question, but it just said that they don't believe in the resurrection, and now here they're saying in the resurrection, so clearly this is something that they're trying to stump Jesus at. They're trying to test him. They're trying to ask him a question where they probably leaned over and be like, oh, let's see him wiggle his way out of this one, right? Like, we really put this one together. We really thought about this. And look what Jesus says in verse 29. You are wrong because you neither know the scriptures nor the power of God. For in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but, like, but are like angels in heaven. And as for the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was said to you by God? I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. You see, Jesus answers these guys in this big, tough question that they have, and they're coming to him, and they're trying to trap him, and he says, have you not read this? Don't you know this? And this happens so often when you really start to look at the Gospels, when Jesus is walking around, he answers people all the time, have you not read this? Have you not seen? Don't you understand? Why do you not know these things? They've already been written. 
Go with me to Matthew chapter 5, and this is a helpful passage as we think about, is the Old Testament still something for us today? Jesus, when he's walking around, he never acts like it's not. Jesus never acts like this is outdated, like, hey, I'm here now, make way for the New Testament, right? We don't need that old stuff anymore. Jesus comes, and he says that he didn't come to abolish it, but he came to fulfill it. Look what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. Do, you, do not think that I have come to abolish or to destroy the law or the prophets, right? There it is right there, the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them. I have come to fulfill them. I've come to do what they say. I've come to do all that the law and the prophets are telling. See, Jesus didn't act like these passages are irrelevant or outdated or we shouldn't listen to them anymore. No, Jesus said, hey, I'm coming to do these things. Look what he goes on to say in verse 18, for truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So Jesus, he's saying, hey, I'm not coming to get rid of this. No, I'm coming to do this. In fact, if you start teaching people to not obey this, well, then you're going to be the least in the kingdom of heaven. See, Jesus wants us to teach the things that are in the law and the prophets and the writings. And I wonder, do we look at those passages? Do we open those books like they are from God? Like these passages, they have an impact on my life today. See, many people think that the God of the Old Testament was mean and he was grumpy and the God of the New Testament is full of love and full of grace, but God, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Go with me real quick to Matthew chapter 23. Look what this says. Go back to Matthew chapter 23. And Jesus, he's pronouncing woes in Matthew chapter 23. He's pronouncing woes on these Pharisees because they're being hypocrites. And he lays down these seven woes of judgment. And he says in Matthew chapter 23, look at what he calls them in verse 33. He says, you serpents, you brood of vipers, have, how are you to escape from the sense, from the sent, to, to be sentenced, sorry, to hell? Therefore, I send you prophets and wise men and scribes, some of whom you will kill and crucify, and some you will flog in your synagogues, synagogues and persecute from town to town. This is what he, look what he says in verse 35. So that... On you may come all the righteous blood shed on earth from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah. Now that might not make sense to you. What do you mean the blood of Abel and the blood of Zechariah? Well, if you think about it, where does the Bible talk about Abel? He talks about him in, the, in Genesis, right? In the beginning, the A, right? We have the A to Z. We have Genesis, the beginning. And if you th- when you find Zechariah, you find his, his, the way that he dies here. It talks about how he died in that verse. He says he's murdered between the sanctuary and the altar. That happens in Chronicles, Now, in our Bible, Chronicles is somewhere over here in the middle of the Old Testament. But if you look at your Hebrew Bible chart, you'll see that Chronicles is the last book of the Hebrew Bible. So Jesus, he's saying, hey, from the blood of Abel in Genesis to the blood of Zechariah in Chronicles, you will be judged for this. You are held accountable for this. It's like the A to the Z, the beginning to the end. Jesus is quoting. He's bringing it all together here. You see, we don't find those treasures maybe in the passages when we read them like this because we don't understand the way that Jesus was referring to the Old Testament or the law, the prophets, and the writings at his time when he was speaking. So it's actually very helpful. It can be really helpful as we look at the Bible when we see them in this order. Now, if you flip your, hand, your little chart over here, we also have some prophecies of Jesus Christ. 
Now these prophecies here, these are just a few of some of the treasures that we found when we were going through the law and the prophets and the writings. And these passages in the, in the Old Testament are passages that we have come to love and adore at our church because all these passages, these tell us about how Jesus would come, that he would suffer, and that he would die. And it, when we read these passages together as a church, man, people were getting saved in these passages. People were growing up in their salvation and their faith in these passages. People were getting, their hearts were burning as they found Jesus here in these passages. And I just want to look at a couple here all together. Go with me back to the beginning. Go with me to the book of Genesis. Because Jesus, when he came, he came not only, he didn't come to abolish the law. He didn't come to get rid of it. No, he came to fulfill the law. In the book of Genesis, right off the bat, we have God. He makes the heavens and the earth and he makes everything perfect, right? He calls everything good. Well, then, we all, then we have in chapter 3, we have the fall into sin. And so now in Genesis, we were once with God and God walked with Adam in the cool of the day and then Adam and Eve chose to sin and now they're separated from God. And, and God, he says this in uh, chapter 3, look at verse 14, okay? So Satan deceives Eve and he gives her this fruit to eat. And it says in chapter uh, 3, verse 14, this is, this is uh, God speaking now to Satan. And he says, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go and the dust, of, and the dust you shall eat all the days of your life. So we have one kind of verse there of judgment. And then he says there's this in verse 15. I will put enmity between you and the woman. And between your offspring and her offspring, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Did you know that the first time that the gospel was ever proclaimed, it was proclaimed by God to Satan there in the garden? Right after, I mean, we're on Genesis chapter 3 here. We've just gotten started, and already we have a prophecy about how from the seed of the woman would come one that would crush the head of the serpent that he would be bruised on the heel, right? He would be nailed to a cross. He would suffer, but he would raise victorious over his foe. He would defeat sin and death. Did you know that that was right there in the book of Genesis? That it's right there in the law. You see, God, he quotes, he says to, to Satan right here in the beginning that he is going to be crushed. He is going to die. And so Satan, when he's trying, when Jesus is getting crucified on that cross, Satan thinks that, that he has won. Satan thinks that he's, he's working through Judas. He's working through the, the leaders of that time. And he wants to see Jesus crucified on the cross. And Satan thinks that he has victory until all of a sudden, three days later, Jesus rises from the dead and gives out the biggest booyah he's ever seen, right? Like, I have risen from the dead. I have fulfilled what the law had spoken. Satan, see, he did not see that coming. And so Satan, he's trying to work through this. He's trying to kill. He's trying to just take, take uh, Jesus down because he knows the prophecy. But in doing so, he actually has Jesus die for our sins, and then he rises from the dead. You see, Jesus, this was the plan all the way from the beginning. This was the, God's plan of salvation ever since Gen Genesis chapter 3, right there in the beginning. There it is. And I know that some of us here, uh, and anyone that goes maybe to a Compass Bible Church, we are all reading through the law and through the, uh, through the New Testament, right? Some of you guys are reading maybe for, through Chronicles. Is anybody out there reading through the book of Chronicles right now? Like that's part of your daily Bible reading. If you're not, your pastor told me you were, so I already asked him, right? That's what you're supposed to be reading, okay? So some of you guys are reading through Chronicles. Might be First Chronicles or might be Second Chronicles or maybe here tonight we can agree that it's just Chronicles, right? You're reading through Chronicles. And uh, some of us, I don't know if you've ever read this or maybe you didn't get through Chronicles. Maybe you didn't get past chapter two or so because because the first like nine chapters of Chronicles, it's all, uh, it's all names, right? It's a big list of names. It's a big list of genealogies, right? If we can be honest here tonight, who's ever like started a genealogy and just been like, blah, 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 and then this happened, right? Anybody ever skipped through that before? Yeah, nope. All right. I like to hear that. Okay. All right. We're being honest here, right? So we, yeah, it's like Jesus, he, the, 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 we got the, the list of names here, right? And Chronicles has this big old list of names. And why are they doing that? Why are they writing all of these names? Why are they keeping track of these names? It's because they're looking for Jesus, 
They're looking for the Messiah. They're looking for the one who was promised by God that he would come and crush the head of Satan. They're looking for the Messiah. They're looking for the Christ, the one that would come. So they're keeping all this list. In fact, in Matthew, when you read it, it starts off with a genealogy, and it's proving to us that Jesus is the one who's been talked about this entire time in the law, the prophets, and the writings. You see, you don't get that if you don't understand why they're writing these passages. And so to us, it might just seem like a list of names, but to them, no, they're searching. They're looking for the Messiah. They're hanging on it. Where is he? When is he going to come? You see, they want to know. They want to see when is Jesus coming, the one who would save us from our sins, the one who was promised to come and defeat death once and for all. You see, they were looking for that, and that's why you have these genealogies. And if you read through them carefully, you'll actually be surprised at how much treasure that you can find in those genealogies. And when you read through the Bible and you're looking for Jesus in the entire Scripture, man, you are going to unlock some amazing treasure from God's Word. You're going to find that there is revival to be found for your soul in the entire Scripture. Right? Go with me to the book of Numbers. This is another one that I love. The book of Numbers. This is a prophecy about Jesus. And uh, it's not written on your prophecy chart. This is a freebie. But in the book of Numbers, chapter 21, there's this prophecy here about this bronze serpent. So Moses, he's led the people of Israel out of the wilderness. And they're now going through the wilderness. And they're, they're kind of traveling through on their way to the promised land, the plant land that God had promised to these people. And, and Moses, right, uh, he says, he's, they, they're, they're heading to the promised land, and he says, look what it says in verse 5 of chapter 21, and the people there that are with Moses, right, they spoke against God and against Moses. Okay, so here's the people, and they're coming to Moses, and they start complaining against God, and they say, why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food, no water, and we loathe this worthless food. I can't imagine how many times my dad heard that from me growing up, right? Dad, there's no food in the fridge. And then he walks me over and opens it. And what's in there? Food, right? Like tons of food. Like, are you kidding me, kid? Like, here's a string cheese, right? There's food everywhere in here. This is what the people say. They're like, God just let us out of Israel. He let us out of Egypt, sorry. And then now they're in the wilderness. And they're like, we don't have any food. We don't have any water. And the food we have, we don't like, right? This is basic complaining 101 here. If you have kids, you've heard it before, right? And then it says here in verse 6 that the Lord, well, what did he do because of their complaining? He sent fiery serpents among the people. Whoa, things just got intense. Like, if you've ever complained before, are you, like, looking out for a fiery serpent? Like, you start complaining, and you're like, oh, wait, I better be careful about that. There could be something coming after me. God sends fiery serpents among the people of Israel, and so that they, the people of Israel died. Like, people were getting bit by these snakes, and then they start dying. Verse 7, and the people came to Moses and said, we have sinned. And we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he may take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole. And everyone who is bitten when he sees it shall live. So Moses, he made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole. And if the, a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and be saved. He would live. And so we have this scenario here where these people are complaining against God. They don't like the way that he's provided for them. And then God sends these fiery serpents to bite them. And then people, they start dying. And so God tells Moses, hey, put a fiery serpent, put a bronze serpent up on a pole, and when people look at that pole, they will be saved. Now imagine that you're one of these people who just complained, and now all of a sudden this snake is starting to chase you, or it comes out of nowhere and just bites you on the leg, and you know, I'm going to die any second. You're on your death crawl here, right? What would you do to go check out that fiery uh, that serpent on a pole? If you knew that there was a way that you can live, you knew that you were going to die at any moment, and you knew that there was a way for you to live, would you not do anything to go and look at it? 
Would you not do anything to go and do it? You probably were crawling on the ground. Man, I just got to get over there and behold and look up at the fiery, the, the bronze serpent there that's lifted up on the pole. I'm going to do everything I can to look at it. Why? Because I trust, I believe that it will save me. You see, if I don't believe that it's going to help me, if I don't believe it's going to save me, well, then I'm not going to go and look at it. Now, what is this talking about? What is he referring to here? Does anybody know in the New Testament, you don't have to shout it out, but does anybody know where, they, maybe just think about it, do you know where this is talked about in the New Testament? Do you know why this story is written? Do you know John 3.16? Who knows John 3.16? Anybody? Anybody know John 3.16? You see, you may not know where this is found, but you probably know John 3.16, that God who loved the world so much that he did what? He sent his one and only son. That whoever believes in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. Go with me to John chapter, uh, John 3.16 real quick. Go with me to the book of John uh, chapter 3. Let's look at this in its context, because John, we, know, we all know the verse, John 3.16, that God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that we can have salvation in his name. But there's actually an unfortunate chapter break here, or I guess head, uh, title break here, because we kind of think that these are two separate thoughts in our minds. But look what he says in verse 14. In John chapter 3, verse 14, just right above John the 3.16 that we know so well, it says, And Moses lifted up a serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. See, just as Moses lifted up that serpent, well, Jesus is also going to be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. See, this prophecy inside the, in the book of Numbers, when all these people are getting chased and bitten, this is a prophecy. This is telling us about Jesus. One of the most famous verses, maybe of all times, John 3, 16. Did you know that Jesus is talking about what happened in Numbers? That he's tying those two things together? That if you are... If you have sin and you are going to die because of your sin, just like the people were going to die because of their sin, they were bitten by these things, just like we are all going to die because of our sin. Man, when we behold, when we look with faith that Jesus, as he's lifted up on the cross, that he's the only one that can save us from our sins. You see, Jesus is saying that serpent in the wilderness, that's about me. And that passage is about me coming to save you from your sin. That when you believe in me, this is the only way of salvation. I must be lifted up on the cross. I must be lifted up on that pole. And so often, we just skip over these passages in the Scripture, and we don't think that they're relevant for us today. This is the most relevant thing that we can talk about with anybody, is that they have sin, and then they need Jesus to save them from their sin. Aren't we thankful that we know that the precious blood of Jesus Christ, that we have put our faith in the gospel? You see, the gospel is all over the place in the law, the prophets, and the writings. And if we ignore these passages, we are missing out on revival for our souls. We are missing out on times that we can share these prophecies with other people. In fact, I know this guy at our church where on his lunch break, he actually tries to get all the, the, the guys there that work with him together, all these non-Christian guys. And you know what he does? He sits there and he opens up the prophecies with them and he tries to explain to them that these are all talking about Jesus. That these are prophesied thousands of years before Jesus would ever come. It explained who he was, that he was the Christ. It explained that he would die for their sins. It explains how he would die for their sins. Even before crucifixion was ever invented, it's prophesied and it is prophesied about how he would rise from the dead. And my friend, he's out there, he's trying to tell guys the gospel. He's trying to tell them through through the prophecies of the Old Testament. See, these are passages that we can come to know and love. Go with me. Just let's finish up with this. Uh, let's go to uh, Psalm chapter 19. Psalm chapter 19, and we'll end with this. Uh, there's been times in my life, I remember one time specifically years ago, where I was just feeling kind of dry, right? I was feeling like, man, I, Lord, I, I want to be really, I want to know your word. I want to, to know who you are. I feel like I'm just distant or whatever it may be. And this verse just came into my mind, right? The Lord just gave, put this verse in my mind. Psalm chapter 19, sorry, verse 7. Psalm chapter 19, verse 7. I want to I read this psalm, just a few verses of this psalm, and I want us to think all together, is this what we believe about the law of God? Is this what we believe specifically about the Old Testament, the law, the prophets, and the writings? Because this is what it says 
in Psalm chapter 19, verse 7. This is what I needed to hear long ago. It says that the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandments of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. See, this is what the writings, this is what the Psalms are claiming about the law that the law of the Lord can actually revive your soul. And I remember reading that passage on that day, and it just, it was so obvious to me. It clicked so easily. You know the reason why I'm feeling this way? It's because I'm not in the law of the Lord. It's because I'm not getting in His Word. It's because I'm not meditating on it day and night. And I wonder, are, we, are our hearts not burning? Do we not have this sense that we love God's Word, that we want to share God's Word, that it's something that is burning within our hearts, that it's reviving us from the inside out because we do not read most of the Scripture? We don't read two-thirds, possibly, of the Bible. We've said this is irrelevant. We don't need this anymore. We're going to stick to the New Testament. We're, we're going to forget all about this. Guys, the law of the Lord, it is perfect. It will revive your soul. It will give you revival. It will give you refreshment that you need if you believe that the law of the Lord is perfect, that it is good, that it's better than honey, that it is better than gold. You see, you wake up every morning, I, I trust maybe on a weekday, and you wake up early and you go off to work because you got to make that bread, right? You got to get that money so that you can live that life, so that you can, you know, support your family and do all the things that God has called you to do. But how many of us wake up in the morning thinking, man, I need to spend time in the law of God because that's where I'm going to get revival for my soul. Let me pray for us all together. God, we are so thankful for the law of the Lord. God, we are so thankful for how Jesus even helps us maybe think about this in a new, fresh way. God, that your law is perfect, that it revives us, that we should know your law, that we should be able to explain to people from your law that Jesus was prophesied to come, that he would die, and that three days that he would rise, and that people should believe in Jesus. God, one of the most compelling reasons for someone to believe the Bible is true is because this book predicts the future before it ever happens. That this book, that you inspired these pages of Scripture and that you use men to write these different books over long periods of time and they all work together, they all weave with one another and that they show us that Jesus was promised to come long before he ever came and that he is the only means of salvation. And God, we just want to apologize for the way that we've treated your word. God, for maybe the way that we think about your word. God, for maybe the way that we dismiss many times the Old Testament, we just kind of skim through it because we're checking the box. We're, we're kind of just doing our normal, or we have to read this to, you know, just check the box day by day. We're reading the Bible and we just kind of want to read it to, to say that I did it. God, please forgive us for that. God, please help us to be people that, that delight in your law, that, that search for it like it's treasure to be found, that looks for it like Jesus our Savior is on the pages all over the place. Father, I pray that we would take and handle your word like it's precious, that we would never think of it as old, God, that we would never think of it as minor or irrelevant, God, that we would see that your entire scripture is profitable, that it is good, that it is pure, that it is going to revive our souls. And if we get out there and we tell people about this, if we read to them these scriptures, God, we believe that people can be saved. Father, I pray that you would increase our faith, that you would help us really to see that your law is perfect and that we can find treasure in it. So God, I just pray that if we take away anything here tonight, Father, that we would love your entire word from cover to cover more today than we ever have before. God, help us to see that there is treasure to be found. Help us to read the Old Testament. Maybe tonight for the first time, or God, I know that many churches in the Compass Circle, God, they're all reading New Old Testament passages and they're all reading New Testament passages. God, I pray that this week, 
as we dive into these passages, Father, that we would look for Jesus, that we would search for him in these passages, and that you would open our eyes to understanding, God, that you would open our eyes to behold marvelous, wonderful things from your law, and that our hearts would burn as we read it, and that you would revive us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.